How many have been blessed, been blessed by this series that we've been in, 24-6? All right, there's about 18 of you that are blessed. The rest of you are either confused or convicted. I don't know. Um, I'm a little bit of both. I'm very convicted, sometimes a little confused because of, uh, I'll be honest with you, this is a very hard word for me. If you're anything like me, and I hope you are because it will make me feel better about myself, um, I'm one who doesn't like to stop. Yeah, thank you. I don't like to stop. There's a few of you. Um, we are driven by accomplishment. We feel satisfied by pursuing something. And um, I remember one time my wife and I went away on vacation, actually just a, a getaway. Just I think it was like a two-day getaway out in PA. And um, we, we were at the hotel, and the next morning we get up in the morning, and it's a beautiful world like in Lancaster County, gorgeous. And we're just kind of sitting there watching TV, and half hour goes by, and an hour goes by. And, you know, I just, I get up, and I'm, she's like, what's the matter? I'm like, nothing's the matter. She said, but why can't you sit still? And I'm like, I didn't even realize. Like, I couldn't even sit still. She's like, just sit down. Like, just relax. And it's like we're driven by, we always have to do something. I mean, part of my nature is like, you got to do, 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 right? You gotta, you're going to come to my home. You're not going to see me just sitting down and sipping a cup of coffee. Say, hey, how are you doing? I'm going to serve you the cup of coffee. Then I'm going to clean the coffee cup. Then I'm going to rinse out the coffee maker. And then I'm going to go grind some fresh beans. And then I'm, then I'm going to bake you a cake or something. I, I mean, I just don't stop. I don't stop. So this series has really been very challenging for me um, because it really rubs against my in, inner nature. But it certainly is one that I know God is speaking to me challenging me and calling me to a place that I know where that I need to be. Three weeks ago when we launched this series, we, we had President David King, uh, Kim, uh, David Kim from uh, Valley Forge University. If you were here, if you remember, he spoke. Um, he spoke about how Christ is our foundation. He is our Sabbath. You know, when Jesus came, he didn't, he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it and to um, reinstate God's intent, when he brought, when he talked about the Sabbath, Christ reinstated the, the intention of what the Sabbath was meant to be. Because Israel, Israelites never really figured it out. To this day, they understand the principle behind it, but have never fully entered into the rest that is available for them. So uh, President Kim spoke about that. Then two weeks ago, Pastor Chris spoke about us understanding the reality of understanding what the Sabbath means. And how, remember, how, how many of you remember that one-minute awkward silence? You remember that? If you were here, he welcomed everyone. All right, let's turn to our Bible. Then he stood still for literal, literally 60 seconds, and everyone was, like, so nervous. Everyone was like, what's going on? Is he okay? Like, did he forget something? Is he getting a text message? Like, what's going on? But how we sometimes can't even stop for 60 seconds because we're so conditioned to certain, so many different things that we have to keep doing, doing, doing. And then last week, he talked about the blessing of the Sabbath, that God intended the Sabbath to be a blessing, right? And he talked about how we need to disconnect in order to connect, that we need to rest and to receive, to delight in him and to draw near, and then to reflect, to contemplate on the goodness of God. And that's our invitation. And so here we are. Uh, today we're going to be concluding this series. Next week we'll launch on a new series, See Like Jesus. You won't want to miss it. But today we're going to talk about how we can actually enter that rest. All right, so you ready? You ready to dive in? All right, let's look at God's word. Matthew chapter 11, starting with verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. It's going to be up on the screen. If you want to take notes, you can. Um, but this is Christ's invitation. He comes to the scene and he calls out in a loud voice to a large group of people. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden 
is light. How many can use that rest? Yeah? Turn to your neighbor and say, yeah, you could use some rest. You could really use some rest. All right, as I kind of begin here, let me give a little bit of context by reading from a, a book that I, I picked up. Listen to what the author says. In the relentless busyness of modern life, we have lost the rhythm between work and rest. All of life requires a rhythm of rest. There is a rhythm in our waking activity and the body's need for sleep. There is a rhythm in the way day dissolves into night and night into morning. There is a rhythm as the active growth of spring and summer is quieted by the necessary dormancy of fall and winter. There is also a tidal rhythm, tidal, T-I-D-A-L, a deep eternal conversation between the land and the great sea. In our bodies, the heart perceptibly rests after each life-giving beat. The lungs rest in between the exhale and the inhale. However, we have lost this essential rhythm. Our culture invariably supposes that action and accomplishment are better than rest, that doing something, anything, is better than doing nothing. Because of our desire to succeed and to meet these ever-growing expectations, we do not rest. How many can relate to that passage? We don't know how to rest. But everything in life has a rhythm. It requires a rhythm. If your heart did not rest in between the beats, that means your heart has stopped and has eternally rested. Your heart needs to rest in between the beats. As you breathe, inhale and exhale, there's a rest that has to happen. And yet, for some reason, we have lost the understanding that we ourselves need to rest. Because we feel like we're driven by what we do and what we accomplish, what we can show other people, how many hours a week we can work. And, and our busyness is sort of like a, a medal of honor that we can wear, a badge of saying, hey, look at me. Look at how hard I work, as if that's some great accomplishment. Everything needs a rhythm. Music needs a rhythm. So I dabble a little bit on piano. And I understand a little bit about music, that there is... There's things in music called like notes, and there's like these symbols in between notes that are called rests. You have that graphic? So these musical notations are very important in music. There's longer ones and shorter ones, depending on what it looks like. So if it's an upside down hat, it's a whole rest. You rest for a whole measure, four beats. If it looks like a top hat, it's a half rest. It's just two beats shorter, and so on and so forth. As you go down the list, it's a shorter, briefer pause, a briefer rest. But music requires rest. Rhythm requires the music and space, music and rest. Our life requires activity, but it requires rest. Both are necessary. So if you ever notice, when we worship, we're not doing this. Okay, everyone, let's praise the Lord. Okay, now let's quietly worship him right now. Okay, be still and know that he is God. Imagine if I play this for the rest of the message, for the next 20 minutes. How would you feel? Pretty good, right? Oh, thank God he stopped. Right? So, I'm playing a rhythm, simple rhythm. There's a slight rest in between. And as a result of that rest, you can appreciate the music. As a result of that rest, you can just sit here and probably fall asleep. Right? So I'll stop. <laughs> but you can appreciate the music because of the rest. You can appreciate the beauty of something because of the rest. If you go to the ocean because you love the ocean, and the waves are just like a tsunami, you're not going to appreciate it too much. But when you see the water cresting over and bubbling up and crashing down, and then it recedes back into the sea and comes again like a pulse, like a heartbeat, 
just breathing, the ocean breathing, swelling, inhaling, exhaling. You could sit there and appreciate it and find rest because there's rest and you can appreciate it. Everything in life requires rest. It requires this rhythm. However, we can't fully enjoy the life that God desires for us without appreciating the rest, the rhythm that he has instituted for us. Look with me in Genesis chapter 1, all the way in the beginning. God begins the Bible by talking about how he created the heavens and the earth. Day 1, day 2, 3, 4, 5, everything he created was good. And by day 6, he now creates man. This is his final creation. Day 6, he creates man. Pick it up in verse 27, and it says, So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Someone shout hallelujah. For God's word, fill the earth and govern it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God says, Look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth. All the fruit trees are for your food. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals, everything that has life. And that is exactly what happened. Then God looked over all that he made. He saw that it was very good. And then the evening passed. The morning came. That marked the sixth day now ended. Genesis 2 verse 1. So the creation of heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. And on the seventh day, God finished his work. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day. Come on, say it's a blessing. And he declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. Do you see what happened here? God created all these things. The earth, the trees, everything that we see and can enjoy. Then he created man, and then his first command was, be fruitful and multiply. Now listen, God could have created man first and said, right, now man, listen, get to it. Pick up a shovel, begin to dig a hole, and I'm going to give you some seed. And, you know, you can throw the seed in there, and, and I'm going to cause it to rain, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause it to grow, but you got to do the work. He could have done that. Kind of takes, it looks like our life now. If we want to see a tree grow, we can't say, let there be trees. We have to pick up a shovel, put on some gloves, get dirty. We're going to have to dig a hole, get a seed, throw it into the ground, cover it back up, add water, and God brings the growth. But when God first created the heavens and the earth, he did it on his own. And when he finally created man, his first word to him was, enjoy your wife. Got quiet in this church. Enjoy. His first, Adam and Eve's first day was not work and toil and labor. It was to sit and enjoy the presence of God and to delight in his wife and to delight in what God gave him. That was their first day. Not God's first day. Man's first day was a day of rest. That was his order. Start with rest, then you'll have what you need to work. But we got the script all flipped around because we feel like we got to work, work, work. We got to work to do what we got to do, accomplish, build, go, build, go buy, and do all these things, work, work, work. And if we have time, then we'll rest. If we can fit it in and squeeze it into our schedule, then we'll rest. As a matter of fact, the problem is is that we never really even can truly rest because by the time we get to that point where after all these 40, 60, 80 hours of work, we're so tired, we get home, and what we call rest is not resting, it's crashing. Plop on the couch with that remote in your hand, a drink in the other hand, and just say, nobody bother me, I need to zone out. No, I don't want to play with the kids right now. What? You want to talk with my wife? I want to watch the sports. I just want to hang out. It's my time now. That's not even rest. We're just crashing because we're so exhausted. And we forfeit what God really desires for us because we're just too busy. Listen, we were made to work. We were. Due to the the curse of of the fall, Adam, now he says, you're going to have to work. It's what we have to do. 
but we also were made to rest. Because we do not rest properly, we are not able to offer the best parts of ourselves to our families, to our jobs, or even to God at times. So this past Monday was my wife's birthday. Everyone say happy birthday, Jessica. And, and uh, so I took her to the chart house in Weehawken. And um, we had a beautiful, beautiful table overlooking um, the skyline of New York City. So it's in New Jersey. You're looking over the skyline of New York City. It was nighttime. Just beautiful. You see the boats along the water and the, just the twinkling of the lights. Clear night. Beautiful sky background. It's just gorgeous. The presentation of the chart house, even the plates were like set perfectly. It was just beautiful, clean. Our waitress was top notch. And then they, they knew it was her birthday, that they actually personalized a menu for her, not by just writing her name like happy birthday, Jessica. They actually had menus printed with her name on it. And it says happy birthday, Jessica. And we're like, what? And it was like... Next level stuff. It was like, wow, this is amazing. But you know what happened? We ordered our food. So Jordan, you still work at the chart house, right? I, were you working that night? I don't know. Jordan works. He works in the kitchen. I have to complain because we ordered our food. My wife orders a fish. I ordered a steak. And they brought us leftovers from the night before. It was like half eaten. It was in an aluminum tin. I was, like, I was like, what is this? Now, you know that didn't happen. <laughs> but imagine if it did. Imagine if, we, if that happened. Imagine we went, we're expecting this experience, and then we get leftovers. But you know what? That's exactly what happens to us when we work, 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 strive, 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 and then we sit at the table, relatively speaking, of our families and our loved ones, and we give them our leftovers. This is all I've got left. Worse still, today you're in church. Had a great time of worship in God's house. Wasn't that awesome? Just to be in God's presence. Man, praise God, I pray this word will be an encouragement to you that you go home and you feel full and blessed. But then what happens? We live on the leftovers of what happened today, tomorrow, and maybe even the next day. I don't mind leftovers the next day. Sometimes they actually taste better. But two days afterwards... Three days afterwards, four days, five days, starts growing fuzzy things on it. And you're like, it certainly wouldn't taste good. But when was the last time you rested in God's presence? Last Sunday? Not meant to be an ouch moment. It's just meant to be like, really like, wow, yeah, I've been busy. So we can forfeit exactly what God has for us, but we settle for leftovers. God desires to prepare a table for us if we only take the time to commune with him. Problem is, too often we forfeit feasting at his banquet table because we're too busy. So if you've ever heard of Corey Ten Boom, Corey Ten Boom once said this, if the devil can't get you to sin, he'll get you to be too busy. You hear that? If he can't get you to sin because you're just that good of a Christian, he'll keep you busy. Because what happens when you get busy, you're running and you run on empty. And you forget to commune with God. You forget to replenish and fill your tank. You forget to enjoy and delight in the goodness of God. But that's exactly what happens. God did not create hurry. The problem is, is that this hurried, busy lifestyle is now the new normal in our westernized culture. Actually, it's, we wear it like a badge of honor. You ever greet somebody, hey, how's it going? Man, just busy. Man, I'm, I'm good, but I'm busy. I'm busy. I, I'm guilty of that. I've said that a million times. But that's not good. We should say, man, how you doing? Man, you know what? God is so faithful. God's given me grace and strength. He's blessed my family. Yeah, I got issues. I got tr tr troubles and trials. But God is faithful. So then listen, what's the answer? I don't, I don't want to take too much time tonight because today I want to get right into the meat of this and then so that we can pray. What's the answer? It is to rest, to slow down, 
simplify our lives around what really matters. You see, when God created man in the image of God, he created all of us with potential for great things. We can accomplish great things because there's the divine potential within us. God says, I have already given you all that you need for life and godliness. The potential is there. But however, we have to understand not only were we made in the image of God, but we were also made out of dust, which means we have limitations. This body can't run on empty for a long time. I can maybe do one week or two weeks of 40 or 60 or 80 hours, but I, sh I can't do it for much longer than that. Eventually, if you don't give your body rest, your body is going to catch up to you and say, whoa, hold up, you need to stop. We need to simplify our lives around what really matters. We can't fully reach our potential without acknowledging our limitations. And that's where the Sabbath comes in. So as I mentioned before, Jesus, when he cried out on the, on the great feast, I believe, when, when he said, come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, come to me, I'll give you rest. He's now talking about something that God established from the very beginning that the Jewish people, the Hebrew people at that time, didn't fully understand. They were very well religious about keeping the law to follow Sabbath. Friday at 6 p.m. when that sun goes down, you stop. Go to Brooklyn this Friday night. Then nobody's driving a car. The streets are packed. People are walking to and fro. But they're eating. They're doing whatever they do, and for 24 hours, they just stop. But that's not what Jesus meant, per se. I think that's part of it. But when he says, I will give you rest, it's not saying, hey, just take 24 hours, and then that's good. You fulfilled your quota. When you read in Hebrews chapter 4, the author says, there is now a Sabbath that's um, made prepared, that's prepared for God's people, but don't be like the Israelites who because of their disobedience never entered that rest. So what, he, what the author in Hebrews is referring to, he's talking about the Israelites back when they were set free from their captivity in Egypt, were brought out into the wilderness, and then God said, I'm going to bring you to a land of milk and honey. We think that the rest that God had for them was the land of milk and honey. But I dare to say it was not the land of of milk and honey. I think that was a byproduct of his blessing, but the rest that God had intended for them, they never realized. N no one ever realized it up until Christ came. Now let me explain further. God delivered the Israelites from Egypt, set them free from their bondage, set them free from their slavery, gave them an identity, made them now a people, the people of God that were marked by the presence of God. They were distinct of all the other nations of, in the earth. And when God led them out, he led them out with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that whenever anyone looked at them, they said, wow, there's something different about those people. Right? And while they were there, Moses had to instruct the people, observe the Sabbath, recognize it, serve God in this way, honor him in this way. But Hebrew says that they never entered the rest that God had for them. But wait, didn't they enter the promised land? Yeah, only after a generation of them had to die in the wilderness. Why did they die? Because of their disobedience. What do you mean their disobedience? They Remember, God delivered them. He was their rescuer. He set them free from their Pharaoh, from their chains, from their slavery. Set them free. Gave them identity. Brought them out of that place, now into a new place. Made them a new creation. And yet, what would they do? They would complain. Oh, we, don't, we don't have any water. God, Moses, why did you bring us here? To die in the wilderness? It would have been better if we died in Egypt. Oh, Moses, it would be better if we were back in Egypt because we had our garlic leeks and onions, and it was so much better there. And they would just complain. And yet God would continue to show them that he's who he is. He's a provider. You can look to him. You don't have to go back to the comforts of what you're familiar with to get satisfied. Come to him. I'll satisfy you, he says. He would, they would say, but we're thirsty. They're in the desert. Where are we going to get water? So God, psh, 
brings water. Oh, but we're hungry. We want meat. So God blows in a wind of quail to be all over the ground. They would eat meat to the point where it was making them gag because their, their mouths were so full. God was showing them, look, I will be ex everything that you need me to be, but why do you keep going back to your slavery? Why do you keep going back to what you think you can do to make it happen? And because of their disobedience, they never entered that rest. Jesus says this, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. How many firmly believe that Jesus has set you free? Yeah? We shout hallelujah. We shout hallelujah. But we often will still want a little bit of slavery in our lives. Because we hold on to the comfort of what we think we need to do to accomplish, to receive, to achieve, rather than just resting in him and what he's done for us and said, Jesus, you're more than enough. You're more than enough. I don't need to work 60, 80, 90, 100 hours in a week to try to accomplish, to get that thing, to go on that trip, to show my neighbor that I got a nicer car, a nicer house than them. I don't need that. Jesus is more than enough. He paid it all. The work's already done. We don't have to strive and hurry and push and just rest in him. Jesus, when he said that people were not made for the good of the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for the good of people. Jesus knew that we needed the Sabbath to rest and replenish so that we can live the abundant life that God intended for us. So how do we do that? How do we do that, Pastor? I mean, come on. I'm asking myself this, church. So let me be absolute honest. God, how do I do this? And then there's this verse like, that says this in John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And listen, we love the life of Jesus. We love his theology, what he stands for. We say yes and amen. We come in agreement to that. We stand in the truth of Jesus, of his ethics. So we believe in, in the life, in the truth, but do we follow the way of Jesus? Do we look at how Jesus lived and say, I'm going to model my life after Jesus by living the way he lived? If you look at Jesus, he was never in a hurry. He was never rushing to get somewhere. He wasn't riding his camel down Bethlehem Way, you know, and some guy cut him off, and he chased him down in his camel. Get over here. He was never in a hurry. He knew how to just rest in his father's provision. My challenge for you today is to learn to rest in him. This way that God calls us. I want to read from Psalm 23, and then we're going to pray. I love this psalm, and um, when you read this psalm, particularly in this translation, which uh, it's called the Passion Translation, it gives you a little bit more of a word pr picture of what the psalmist is saying. But listen and read it on the screen the words of Psalm 23 with the thought of rest in mind, Okay? Think about it from the perspective of rest. Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brook of bliss. That's where he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and he leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me. Listen, for you already have. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you are near. You become my delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. 
You give me all that I can drink of you until my heart overflows. So why would I fear the future? For you pursue, for your goodness and your love pursues me all the days of my life. And then afterward, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be with you forever. So our challenge, my challenge, is we could just receive this word and say, okay, praise God. Yes, yes and amen. Then we go on, jump right back onto that hamster wheel and just keep running. And just keep running. We could choose to do that. Or we could choose to say, all right, Holy Spirit, this so goes against the grain of what I'm familiar with because I'm kind of comfortable with a little bit of my slavery. I'm used to that. I've kind of grown accustomed to that. I'm, that's normal for me now. And it's hard for me to just say, God, I'm, I'm going to just stop. I'm going to rest. I'm going to delight in you and in your presence. I'm going to take time to think about the goodness of God. It may be hard for us to switch gears. But my call to you is that we need to just not let these last four weeks just be another series, just another day of another message, but that this now becomes a new way of life for us. Romans talks about no longer conforming to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, changing the way you think. I want to challenge you to change the way you think. I want to challenge you to think about your life, think about the pace, think about all that you do. And listen, in the end, you might have more stuff, but it's never worth the cost of maybe forfeiting relationships and family and drawing closer to God. Never. One last portion of scripture. I started with this portion of scripture, Matthew 11, verse 28, but I want to read it in the, Matthew, in the uh, uh, message translation. Ponder these words, then I'm going to have the team sing a song. And look, I know our, our custom and habit is, especially since we're a little over time, which I apologize for that, our custom and habit would be as when the, when the minister says, all right, as I close, we're putting on our coats, grabbing our bags, and getting ready to go check out our kids because we, we want to beat the rush out of here and get to lunch. Please, don't, don't hurry. You'll get your kids it's a couple more minutes. I'm not going to keep you long. But I want you to take a moment to just sit in his presence and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Listen to God's word. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. Just in this room, I want you to just zone out everything else for just next two minutes. Get with God. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I'm going to ask the team to sing this song. Reflect on what the words are saying. Ask the Spirit of God to speak to you. Then we'll pray and we'll dismiss. I have a seat at the table. I know who I am. I know who I am. I have a seat at the table. I know who I am. I know who I am.
Father God, I ask that you seal this word into our hearts. God, we want to enter that rest that you've provided for us. God, not only that physical rest, yeah, we need that, but understanding, Jesus, that you've paid the price for us. We don't have to earn our way into salvation. We just need to come to you. We're tired. We're heavy laden. We want to find rest for our souls. So, God, I pray your blessings upon your people. That, God, you would help us to be a peculiar people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart. God, if we just look like the rest of the world, then who are we? Help us to be distinguished among this world that when people look at us and say, wow, there is something different about them because of who you are in our lives. So Jesus, we thank you for your word. I pray your blessings upon your people as they go. Cover them, protect them, bless their homes, bless these weeks. May the burden be light as we rest in you, in Jesus' name.